Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Table for One, please. My name is Tommy Hensel, and if you've been following me, you know that I am reviewing all of the cookbooks on my bookshelf. And I started at the far left, and I'm working my way through one cookbook at a time. So I just finished reviewing the second of all of those cookbooks. It's this cookbook right here. It's called 52 Sunday Dinners by Elizabeth O. Hiller. Uh, you can see it's not in great condition because it was published in 1913 and it belonged to my great-grandmother. Uh, so I'm going to be cooking a recipe out of this cookbook. So if you read my blog or if you watched my last video, you'll know that I used a random number generator and the number that it came up with was page 15. Now what's interesting about this cookbook is that it's aligned in 52 sections, each for one Sunday of the year. And so each section is a full menu for a meal for six people. Six very hungry people, actually. So the first Sunday of the year, they, they think of it kind of as a New Year's Eve meal. So it's probably the most complicated of all of the recipe collections within the cookbook. So on page 15, there were three recipes, but let me give you what the actual full menu was. So for that first Sunday of the year in 52 Sunday dinners, Elizabeth O. Hiller put together this menu. Oysters on the half shell, consomme duchess, imperial sticks, crab meat in timbale cases, roast goose with potato and nut stuffing, chantilly applesauce with horseradish, onions au gratin, endive, celery, and green pepper salad, vanilla ice cream with hot chocolate sauce, coconut cubes, and chocolate nut cake. I am so happy I'm not having to cook that entire thing, and I'm also very happy that the random number generator did not give me the roast goose, because I might lose my mind if I tried to do that. But the page that it did give me was the page that contained crab meat and Swedish timbale cases. So interestingly enough, I decided to do that one. Um, so there's some very interesting ingredients and interesting techniques involved in that recipe that are gonna make it kind of intriguing for me to do. So first, let me grab a couple of ingredients that I forgot to put out so I can tell you what all of the things are that will be involved in this recipe. So first, you have the timbale cases, and I talked for a minute about how to make those, but that's essentially flour, sugar, butter, milk, uh, creating kind of a batter that you then fry. The crab meat is actually made with a little bit of sauteed onion in butter. Uh, then it's obviously lump crab meat. Now the recipe, it seems clear when you read it, it talks about reheating the crab meat, which means that they're assuming that you've actually cooked the crabs yourself, you've cleaned them, you've picked the meat out, that was the day before or two days before, and now you're reheating the crab meat in the cream sauce. But I'm not going to be cooking crabs for you today. I'm gonna to be using crab meat. Um, and then there's a white sauce that goes with the crab that involves some thin cream uh, and a few other ingredients, salt, pepper. And then once you're done and you put the crab meat into the timbale cases, you sprinkle just a little bit of paprika, mustard, and cayenne and nutmeg uh, on them for color and also for just a little bit of flavor. So, and obviously eggs are involved in both portions of this. So I'm gonna be making those for you today uh, but first, it's really interesting is that the timbale thing baffled me because I didn't know what a timbale was. Did a little research, discovered that vintage timbale cases are out there, but you have to actually you know, go to an antique store or order one. But you can go on Amazon and find more modern versions. And this is the modern version. So what we have here um, is a little, looks like a little wand or a little divining rod, uh, but it's threaded. And the timbale cases came in rosettes and cases. So we have different types of rosettes, as you can see. But we also have different kinds of cases. We have a square one, a round one, and a heart-shaped one. So what you actually do is you screw the case onto the timbale wand, or iron, timbale iron, excuse me. That looks like a wand to me. So you screw it on, then you insert it into hot oil, and once it's super hot, you take it out, you dip it into the batter, and then you dip the batter back into the hot oil and you fry it. Then you take it off, invert it, and let it cool. So I have bought this just for this, but now I've got this cool, interesting thing that I can use for other stuff. And in fact, when I make this um, 
batter, I'm going to have a lot left over, so I may make some rosettes or something just for the heck of it. Now, those of you who have been following me know that one of the hallmarks of this cookbook was that it was also an advertorial for a product called Cotyline. Now, Cotyline no longer exists, and the reason it no longer exists is because it went into a PR war with a product called Crisco, and Crisco beat it out, and so Crisco became more of a household item. So you will all, if you've seen my previous video or if you've read my review, you will get the irony of this that because I have to fry the timbales in oil, since cotyledon doesn't exist, I am using Crisco. So hopefully Elizabeth O'Hiller is not rolling over in her grave that I'm using Crisco instead of cotyledon. And if you're interested in the um, timbales, these are the ones that I bought. They're from Norpro. I bought them on Amazon.com. So this is going to be a brand new experiment for me. You know, making the batter is easy and actually making the cream sauce and adding the crab to it, those are super easy preparations. The hard part is going to be frying those timbales in these cases. So that's going to be an intriguing thing for us all to see because I'm not going to practice before I show it to you. I'm going to try to do it live. So wish me good luck. So now I'm going to go away for a while. I'm going to do a little preparation, make the batter. And then when I come back, we'll be working on frying those timbales. So hopefully everything will turn out fine. Crisco. Hello everyone. Welcome back to Table for One, please. I am now in the cooking area of my kitchen. So what you'll notice is that I have broken out the cast iron and I uh, melted the Crisco. Um, I am using a thermometer because I wanted to make sure that it stays at about 375 degrees, which it's a little bit hot right now. So I'm going to turn it down. Uh, I have the timbale iron in there. Now what's interesting about this cast iron is this was handed down in my family. So I believe it belonged to my grandmother. So I have a feeling that it actually may have actually belonged to my great grandmother, the one who owned this cookbook. So there's a possibility that she actually cooked something like this in this very same cast iron. Of course, probably not with Crisco, although Crisco was around after 1911, so you never know. So here's the deal with the timbales. I have uh, been heating the timbale iron. I have not practiced this, so you're seeing it for the first time. Um, I believe that it's probably up to heat. Here is my batter that I made a little bit earlier. It's a little bit thicker than I thought it would be, so I'm not sure if I did something wrong. So we're now gonna find out if this works or not. So I am pouring the hot oil out. I'm putting it in right to the top of the mold. Whoops. So this is not working the way that it should. Well, so there we see that my first attempt at a timbale was a total failure. So we're going to stop and we're going to come back. I'm going to practice one and then we'll do it again. Well, I'm back. Um, I discovered that the, I think that the batter was a little bit too thick. So I thinned the batter out a little bit and I tried a prototype. I'm not going to show it to you because it looks horrible, but uh, it did kind of work. So I fortified myself with a little glass of Lille Blanc, which I bought so I could make a Vesper Martini later. I'm going to need one after this. All right. So now let's try this one more time. A satisfying sizzling sound. It comes up, it's got batter on it. See that? Woo! You can't see this, but it's, um, you can maybe even hear it from my microphone. It's definitely sizzling happily right now. So we're gonna see if I can get a Tim. So th this was my first attempt at a Timbale case. You can see it actually does look kind of like a case. It's just not real pretty. Uh, part of the problem is that my batter was not as smooth as it should be. It was a little lumpy, but you know, there we go. So I'm letting this fry. You're supposed to fry it till it's a light golden brown. And I have my oil hovering at about 375 degrees right now. So we should be okay. The interesting thing about this batter is I think it could be used for all sorts of stuff because it's got salt and sugar in it, but just a tiny bit of sugar. So it's really more savory than sweet. 
Um, it's the kind of thing that you could either create those rosettes or create these different shaped um, timbale cases uh, and fill them with pretty much anything. Uh, I imagine uh, I'm going to be doing it after they've cooled a little bit, but if you could do them quick enough, you could actually still have them warm. I also imagine that you could put them in the, uh, the oven to keep them warm as you were making them. All right. Well, I think because of the batter being lumpy, I'm getting lumpy timbale cases. I think if the batter were smoother, and what I didn't do was they suggested, okay, so you can probably see that timbale case on. Now I'm trying to figure out the best way to release it from the mold because it's 375 degrees, so I'm certainly not going. There we go. I'm not going to touch it. All right. I know everybody's out there probably getting really bored watching this slow, slow process. There we go. There's a timbale case. All right. I have two. They're not beautiful, but they're actually timbale cases made from an actual Swedish timbale iron. I am so excited that I didn't burn down my apartment. All right, so now I'm going to sign off, make a couple of more of these, and then when I come back, we will assemble the uh, sauce and the crab meat and then ultimately put it all together and see what we came up with. So until then, I'm gonna have a little sip of Lille. Well, hello, we are back again. I did try a few more timbale cases. I have to admit, they all look fairly horrible. Uh, but at least I understand the technique and I did manage to make a couple of them that will hold this crab meat stuff that I'm making. So it's not a total loss, but believe me, this is something I'm going to have to practice in order to get better at because that was not as easy as I thought it would be. So what I'm doing right now is I'm sauteing uh, some finely chopped onion in some butter. And to that, I am going to add a little bit of flour and stir that until it's all well blended. So essentially what I'm getting ready to do is make, a, a, I'm basically making a, a rudimentary roux. And there we are. And then I have hot cream. And I need to add the hot cream just a little bit at a time. Stirring as I go. So I'm trying to make sure that it doesn't like completely curdle or get lumpy with all of the um, the flour. So I'm adding the hot cream to the flour, butter, and onion mixture. There we are. Nice. All right, I'm just going to let that stir for a minute. Okay, that's looking pretty good. I'm going to put a little bit of paprika because the recipe calls for a touch of paprika, which of course is not cooperating with me on camera. There we go. Uh, I am going to throw a little bit of salt in there and some freshly ground pepper. All right, stirring all that together. All right, so this becomes basically the, the basis of the white sauce for the crab, but the one more ingredient is eggs. Now it calls for adding the egg yolk, but as anybody knows who's ever tried to do this, you really need to add the hot liquid into the egg yolk first, a little bit at a time. And I'm right-handed, so I need to do this. And whisk continuously so that the eggs don't curdle. If I added the egg yolks directly into this hot cream sauce, it would have become like scrambled eggs instead of what it's meant to be. All right, so now 
I'm going to integrate the egg yolk, there we go, into this cream sauce. So I'm going to try to show it to you. Um, it's actually a pretty decent looking sauce. You can see it. It's nice and thick. Hmm. Okay. It needs a little bit more seasoning. So I'm going to do a little more seasoning and then I'm going to let it cool for a little bit before I add the crab meat because I don't want to overcook the crab meat. So I'm going to go away. Oh, where's my drink? There's my lily. I'm going to go away, season this a little bit, and then come back and put it all together. So it'll be just a few minutes and I'll be back with you. Well, hello everyone. Finally, we get to the end of this epic process. I made the Swedish timbales. I made the crab meat stuff to go into them. So here's the final product. You can see it here. My timbale cases, as you can see, are not beautiful. They're all lumpy, but you know, for a first attempt, not so bad. Um, I haven't tasted the crab meat concoction yet, but I did, as the recipe suggested, sprinkle a few grains of cayenne, mustard, and nutmeg on the top of each one. So we're going to take a bite. Oh, and by the way, I'm pairing this today with one of my all-time favorite sparkling wines. This is a Donaldson uh, from Sonoma. It's a 2016 sparkling rosé. It's another one of the wines that I get from Naked Wines, which I will link in the written review of this recipe. Uh, but please, if you are interested in Naked Wines, go check them out. It's an awesome wine club. Oh, that's one of my favorite sparklings. So, all right. Here we go. Crab meat in Swedish timbales from page 15 of 52 Sunday Dinners by Elizabeth O'Hiller, published in 20, uh, 2013, in 1913. So we're gonna cut into a timbale. Ooh. Well, the timbales are a little tougher than I thought. Oh, oh yeah, that's really nice. I can really taste the crab meat. That little tiny hint of mustard and nutmeg and cayenne on top is a fascinating little accompaniment to this very simple white sauce. Oh yeah, this, this one is a good one. So I'm excited, I made it through. I'm gonna practice my timbale making and I'm gonna get better at it. So maybe down the line, I'll show you another timbale. But until then, I am, as always, epicuriously yours.